to um, our second digital lunch break science. Um, I, I'm Tim Schull and I'm, uh, I'm the host of the meeting today. Um, uh, lunch break science, as you know, is a speaker series and we do a range of STEM topics and the event is sponsored by Bon Secours. Um, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Jeremy Hoffman. He's our chief scientist, Science Museum of Virginia. He's an affiliate faculty in the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs and the Center for Environmental Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. Dr. Hoffman has served as a member of the Environmental Committee for the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, a science communication fellow for the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, and the Mitchell Hamline School of Law. He was recently honored as one of Style Weekly's Richmond's Top 40 Under 40 and one of the Grist 50 fix, fix, that. <laughs> Grist 50 Fixers for 2020. That's a uh, tongue twister. Um, so we're very pleased that Jeremy now works for us. Um, he's quite, uh, quite the fine. So uh, a little ground rule and a little bit more information about today's Lunch Break Science. If you uh, have to sign off early or you uh, miss one, they are ultimately going up on our Science Museum of Virginia YouTube channel. Uh, we'll let you know when that happens via our social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, we're always posting new things to do during uh, the COVID-19 uh, quarantine. So there's tons of things to check out, keep you entertained. During the talk itself, if you have questions that you want Jeremy to answer at the end of his talk, um, please uh, put them in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat, making sure he gets any of the questions that uh, you might have. Um, and uh, please be respectful uh, in the chat of all of your fellow attendees. It looks like at the moment we've got about 78 of you, so um, keep that in mind. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hoffman. Enjoy the show. Great. Thank you so much, Tim Scholl, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a, a thrill to be back on the Lunch Break Science uh, stage, even if it has to be over a Zoom room. Um, I'm so excited to share with you some of the stuff that we've been learning about over the last several years um, as part of uh, ongoing research that we've had in um, collaboration with Virginia Commonwealth University and the University of Richmond uh, and the uh, Portland State University uh, in, out in Oregon and some recent collaborations that we've had with uh, uh, folks at the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality uh, and even now the Virginia Department of Transportation. So uh, I'm titled this talk, Exploring a Changing World in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and uh, I think it, you'll, you'll see that um, there's a lot to explore and I'm excited to share uh, some of the things that we've learned uh, through time and just over the last several weeks. So um, first, I need to introduce you to myself a little bit more. Uh, I grew up as a fisherman in northwestern Wisconsin. I'm from the Midwest. Uh, I was um, uh, growing up, born outside of Chicago and uh, grew up along the Mississippi River in, in Iowa. And my family would go up to northwestern Wisconsin to vacation during the summer. And my dad taught me how to fish. And we would chase uh, all, all manner of different types of uh, um, species in the freshwater lakes of northwestern Wisconsin, um, but by far my favorite uh, was a, uh, a walleye. And the walleye are bottom feeding um, kind of deep dwelling uh, species that enjoy cold water. Um, they're also extremely delicious. Uh, if you've never woken up on uh, a, mo uh, in a, <laughs> uh, a morning in northwestern Wisconsin to have um, fried walleye and eggs, um, I don't know if you've lived yet uh, in some ways. Uh, you know, I, everybody has their own opinion, but I think that the walleye is by far the most delicious um, breakfast fish available to us. Uh, and many people up in the northwestern part of Wisconsin agree. Uh, it, in fact, it, it forms a large part of uh, fishing, commercial fishing and recreational fishing form a large part of their economy there. And so when uh, I started getting uh, information from uh, friends uh, and colleagues in that area uh, about um, newspaper clippings that they were seeing from that area, that walleye were uh, seeming to decline. And, you know, it wasn't just a, a story being told in the, in the uh, you know, 
uh, roadside bars and, and you know, uh, elks clubs that people weren't uh, catching these fish anymore. And it was actually the DNR had to get involved. And you can see from this Sawyer County record, you know, walleye decline may be due to temperatures or food. Um, I think also they call it a mystery. And uh, what, what the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, was able to do is like look back at uh, 30 or so years worth of data uh, about the walleye and the uh, a, a related species known as the largemouth bass. But largemouth um, are, one, not as delicious as the, uh, as the walleye. Uh, we didn't, I don't think bass is a very uh, approachable fish whatsoever. Um, but they, and they enjoy a very different habitat uh, within the same lakes. So walleye like cold, deep water, uh, largemouth bass thrive much more in, uh, in warmer uh, surface waters and in shallower conditions. And so what they were able to look, like, uh, uh, look at over time was a changing relationship between these two species. And most of my charts today are gonna go from uh, something, uh, most of the time it's gonna be a graph uh, with up on the, on the y-axis being an increase of some particular um, variable. And then uh, uh, across the bottom will generally be time. And time will almost always go from the past to the left to the present or the future on the right. And so when we look at the relationship between these two species, in the red, we have the largemouth bass, and in blue, we have the walleye. Through time, the uh, fish counts from the Department of Natural Resources were tracking relatively more bass uh, at the same time as seeing relatively fewer juvenile uh, uh, walleye. And uh, through modeling of the kind of conditions that these two fish enjoy and knowing that they uh, thrive in different kinds of conditions, what the DNR was able to uh, uh, conclude from this study and several updated studies in the years since was that it seems like this walleye decline is really a symptom of a, uh, of a changing climate in Wisconsin. And when they look at the long-term warming of these lakes, uh, many lakes in, in eastern Wisconsin have warmed up by a degree and a half or more uh, over the last several decades. Uh, the star I have here is where my family would go vacation up in northwestern Wisconsin. Um, and by and large, almost every body of water has warmed up uh, in, in some appreciable way, and that has driven a decline in these walleye populations. Not something else like the availability of food or the decrease in, um, uh, it, like, or the availability of different things that they might enjoy, because the depths haven't changed. Uh, really, the only thing that has changed is when these lakes lose their ice at the end of the winter. Uh, it turns out that they're thawing much earlier, and so the lakes can absorb much more of the sun's energy throughout uh, an individual season, uh, providing the warming necessary to tip the scales towards these more largemouth bass-dominated lakes to the walleye-dominated lakes. Now that makes me sad because if I take you know family uh, to northwestern Wisconsin in the future, I want to be able to wake them up with a uh, with a breakfast of walleye and eggs uh, as well. But um, unfortunately, it seems like uh, we need to do some uh, some careful consideration of how to keep the environment the same so that we can all enjoy the natural resources that we've been granted by this landscape. Um, uh, in the same way now and into the future. Now, why does this relate back to now our work here in, in Virginia? Well, unfortunately, it seems like streams uh, across the state of Virginia are showing this same trajectory. Uh, and this is for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, air temperature and climate warming here in Virginia uh, is, is a, a primary uh, driving force between uh, behind this, but also loss of shading along our rivers has warmed up air uh, water temperatures as well. Um, but since the uh, mid 1950s, uh, several streams around this, the Commonwealth of Virginia have warmed up over five degrees Fahrenheit, um, and uh, it seems like only one uh, or, or a very few number of them are uh, uh, close to zero warming. So that uh, what what I just told you about the state of Wisconsin. We're seeing similar trends, not only here in Virginia, but around the world. And uh, so I figured that's a good way to, to introduce you to myself a little bit and to bring home the conversation um, to, to Virginia. And, and before uh, we get into more of the stories about specifics here in, in Richmond and around uh, the Commonwealth, I think I would spend a little bit of time talking about the history of what we know about climate change, because I think in some ways this part of the conversation has, um, has not been included in a lot of what we talk about. Um, 
In order to start at the beginning, we have to go back to a mathematician, a French mathematician named Joseph Fourier in 1824, who was smart enough to deduce that without an atmosphere, uh, the, the earth would be much cooler than it, it is. In fact, it would be uninhabitable. So without coining the term, he's the one that just derived the understanding of what is known as the, uh, the greenhouse gas effect. Uh, about you know 30 or so years later, um, uh, you can see some some of the facial hairstyles of the time had changed by this time. But uh, John Tyndall uh, was is credited as having done the first experiments by uh, you know uh, uh, isolating different gases and seeing how they react with um, with uh, energy from the sun deducing that carbon dioxide and water vapor tend to be very strong greenhouse gases. Uh, and, and at the same time, actually, without, um, uh, you know, even though John gets the credit now, there was a woman named Eunice Foote who was actually doing these same sorts of experiments about the same time. But because she was a woman, she was unable to, to print her own findings about uh, her experiments uh, at the same time uh, back in, in uh, three years before John Tyndall, actually. Uh, Building on Tyndall's work in 1896, uh, kind of get rid of the mutton chops and move it towards the mustache. We have Sponte Arrhenius, who is a, a Scandinavian um, researcher who looked into, okay, so based on Tyndall and Fourier's work, what if we were, you know, because of all the industrialization going on around him, he started to notice that, wow, these things, combustion of fossil fuels actually produces a lot of this heat trapping gas like carbon dioxide. And so he was the first one to actually uh, do the calculations on, well, what if we double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere? And still to this day, we do um, uh, a lot of our climate modeling is to simulate what the total amount of warming might be for a doubling of CO2. It turns out that Arrhenius wasn't that far off from even our best estimates of today. Um, so as, as soon as 1896, we had a pretty good grasp that human activities might actually drive uh, climate to change in towards a warming effect. Um, then uh, back in you know the late 1930s uh, calendar, we're kind of back to clean shaven was the style, of course. Um, and he was the first to start linking together uh, observations of changing CO2 around the world uh, alongside uh, temperature changes. And so he was the first one to claim that uh, humans had had an observable change uh, in the Earth's temperature due to uh, emissions of heat trapping gases like carbon dioxide. So as, you know, as soon as 1938 and then all the decades afterwards have really laid the foundation for modern climate change science. Um, and so I just thought a review of what we know from uh, history and this idea of climate change isn't, uh, isn't really a new thing. It didn't start just a couple decades ago, but more like a couple hundred years ago. Uh, it's almost a 200 year anniversary of uh, the discovery of the greenhouse gas effect. So uh, real quickly, the natural greenhouse gas effect, of course, solar radiation comes in, uh, the surface of the planet absorbs um, a lot of that, re-emits it back into the air in long wave. That's then trapped by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, um, keeping us at a livable temperature. Uh, but the intensified greenhouse gas effect due to human emissions of heat trapping gases uh, um, lowers the amount of that radiation escaping back into space. This is something that we can observe going on uh, from satellites in space, as well as uh, more heat trapped at the surface, which of course we've seen going on in the temperature records uh, around the world. So you can think of it as, even though it's not perfect in a physical sense, that too just adds more blankets to the surface of the planet um, and causes it to warm up. Now, how do we know that CO2 has actually been changing? Like the idea that, well, if, if humans have been intensifying this greenhouse gas effect, we must be understanding how greenhouse gases have been changing. And in order to know more about that, we have to go to La Jolla, California, um, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, where um, for the last uh, 60 or so years, uh, a family name of Keeling have been going out to the Scripps Pier uh, and in places all over the world now and capturing, if you can see this little tiny, it looks like a bulb that this person is holding. And uh, Ralph and uh, um, David Keeling uh, have been dutifully going to the same spot on this uh, La Jolla Pier uh, and walking into the wind. They, so they hold open this chamber and they hold their breath and they walk into the wind and capture a flask full of air. And what they're able to do is then take that air that's coming off of the Pacific Ocean, uh, trap it and put it into a uh, analyzer, which then tells the concentration of the amount of CO2 in, the, in that uh, particular flask. What's amazing is that he started uh, 
his, this person's father started taking these measurements back in 1958, I believe. And this graph, uh, again, along the bottom, uh, 1960 to the left, the present day on the right. And up on this is the amount of CO2 as measured in those, uh, in flasks of air. These are collected at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, um, but the trends are much the same just about anywhere else in the world that you look. Uh, and so what uh, was interesting about what the Keeling family has found uh, repeatedly is that um, even though there are year to year variations that kind of make this little jagged sawtooth pattern, by and large, the trend has been towards an, uh, higher amounts of CO2 over time. And, um, you know, in this graph I produced on the 28, and back in 2018, it was over 400 parts per million. Um, the first time that 400 parts per million were, were, was breached back in 2013, and now it's continued above that number. Um, and you, you might ask, like, well, what's going on with this, uh, like, sawtooth pattern? Uh, and actually, the northern hemisphere controls much of this. Much of the land mass of the planet is in the northern hemisphere. Much of the plant mass, plant biomass, uh, is in the northern hemisphere. And actually, as they grow throughout the spring, that absorbs CO2 through the process of photosynthesis. You know, uh, plants use light and carbon dioxide to turn it into sugar and oxygen. We enjoy that oxygen uh, as we need to breathe. And as those plants die and decay into the fall, they actually release that CO2 back into the air. And with no change in the amount of biomass uh, on the planet, then that's what that produces, that little jagged breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out of the planet. So that jagged pattern is actually the Earth's breathing, which I think is really amazing. But uh, superimposed on that, of course, is that long-term trend towards higher CO2, which now we understand to be uh, uh, related directly to the amount of carbon dioxide being produced from human emissions uh, related to the burning of fossil fuels for energy. And so uh, one good question is like, well, how do we know how different this is from times in recent Earth's past? And in order to do that, we have to start using innovative ways of, uh, of copying that same kind of experiment, that little flask uh, trapping that air. Where does air naturally get trapped? Well, it turns out back in the, starting in the 1960s, about the same time, uh, some really uh, amazing smart scientists were beginning to understand that as snow accumulates in uh, places like Greenland, Antarctica, and Alpine glaciers, through time, the increasing weight of the snow above that layer uh, eventually traps the uh, air around it in little tiny bubbles. Um, this is a process that uh, takes many years in order to close off. Uh, these air uh, bubbles, but you can see here on the right, these are some scientists in Antarctica from Oregon State uh, pulling out of the ground these long tubes of ice. You can think of it as almost like a hole punch through the middle of a big um, uh, planetary yearbook and taking just one hole punch uh, through the center of a chapter might tell you just a bit of the story. So we've actually expanded all of these ice cores to be all over Antarctica, all over Greenland, and in many of the alpine glaciers around the world. And we seem to find basically the same story wherever we look. And what's amazing about this is when we started to analyze the bubbles here on the left, you can see how they form little tiny versions of little tiny portions of air like that flask that the Keeling, um, that Dr. Keeling was holding in the previous slides. And they start to analyze that for the amount of CO2 in it. So this was a paper that came out back in the 1980s. Uh, up on the graph again, on, on the left is this concentration of CO2 uh, measured in those bubbles. And then across the bottom is time again towards the present to the right. And in blue here, this is the, the amount of CO2 that was measured in the bubbles in Antarctic ice. This is specifically from Law Dome in Antarctica. And you can see the blue bubbles, um, you know, they the, uh, are... Uh, generally showing an uptrend from 1830 to about 1970. And what they were able to do then is to match that directly with the observations that the Keeling curve was uh, generating from Mauna Loa and from the, from, uh, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. What's amazing is that they overlapped very, very well. Um, I think, to me, I think that the overlap between this natural archive, little tiny bubbles in the snow and ice in Antarctica, reflecting the exact same conditions that a scientist was measuring directly from the air in Hawaii and in uh, California, is one of the most captivating discoveries in all of the history of science. And I think that um, 
it's still something that I have an absolute um, uh, fascination with uh, that I, that's partially why I continue to study um, paleoclimate and all the things that we can learn from these archives like, net, like uh, ice cores. And so one of the questions here is then, okay, well then if we know that it reliably records a global signal of CO2, well, what, what, does, what do other longer and older ice cores tell us? And so if we move backwards, here's the same data just presented uh, in, in a different way. Here's, uh, for reference, here's the Declaration of Independence. It was somewhere between 270 to 280 parts per million of CO2 back at the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And here we are up in that yellow, uh, yellow uh, star up in the corner at 410 parts per million. Now, another good question is like, okay, so how weird is this? Um, you know, how it, if it could be that we have had cycles much larger than this in the near, in the near future or in the near uh, Earth's history. So we can move even further back about the last 10,000 years. And so here's uh, the, the yellow uh, arrow here is the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And what I'm going to add here is when humans started agriculture. It turns out some hypotheses is that uh, early human development of the surface of the planet and farming uh, capability actually started to release a little bit of CO2 earlier. Uh, and that's part of what you might see it here in this kind of long-term rise before the sharp rise due to the industrial revolution. But basically for the last 10,000 years, since humans became the thing uh, and human civilizations started to happen, um, we've enjoyed a very narrow range of CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Another good question is, well, how weird is this? If it, the last 10,000 years, well, how far can we look back in order to understand how much this has changed through time? And so the longest ice core on the, uh, ever generated uh, for the recent Earth history is from Dome C in Antarctica. It goes back about 800,000 years. And when we look at what those data show us is that there seems to be just like there's that seasonal cycle between breathing in and breathing out from the growth and decay of Northern hemisphere biomass is that we also have a growth and decay uh, signal at the kind of a hundred thousand year time scale. This turns out to be what is known as the Milankovitch cycles of ice ages. Um, so down uh, where it gets to down to like 160, 170 parts per million are times when the earth is very much colder, three to four degrees Celsius, which is roughly, you know, six to eight degrees Fahrenheit cooler than that. The, than, um, than usual massive two mile thick ice sitting on top of the city of Chicago kinds of climates uh, when the ice ages were very extensive. And then up on this graph, the, the high points in this graph are what are known as interglacials or non ice ages. That's what we've been enjoying for the last 10,000 or so years. And those are separated by about 100,000 year cycles. These are now known to be uh, um, uh, caused generally by the configuration of the Earth's orbit around the sun. So as the orbit becomes more circular or more egg-shaped, uh, and then the tilt of the planet, so how much of the Earth's uh, north pole, or the intensity of the Earth's tilt um, determines the uh, amount of sunlight by latitude, and then where our uh, uh, solstice and equinoxes occur, uh, which is known as precession. All of those things occur over the time scales of like 16 to 100,000 years. So something that we would never generally experience in our lifetimes. And in fact, it's many tens and hundreds of human lifetimes to even see any sort of observable climate impact from these natural climate cycles that have occurred during the last 800,000 years. And what's really uh, amazing is that even when humans evolved, as far as some of the best estimates are concerned, around 300,000 years ago, um, we've enjoyed a relatively small amount of CO2 change uh, even during those times. And uh, at very in increasingly, um, evidence is supporting the fact that humans are releasing CO2 faster than at any other time in at least the last 65 million years and potentially the last couple hundred millions of years. Um, which is uh, really impressive given how quickly uh, the earth was able to do it naturally on its own in, uh, in previous times. So um, this, of course, this uh, rapid rise in CO2 has been accompanied in, uh, similarly by an intense and rapid rise in the Earth's temperature. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, it's not uh, 408 parts per million anymore. As, as of yesterday uh, or last month, I think it was uh, uh, up over 415 parts per million. So the trend continues. Um, this, of course, has led to a, a substantial warming of the planetary system. Um, here's just one way to look at the warming through time uh, as global temperatures since 1850 by color, um, with the reds being, of course, re uh, relatively warmer temperatures, blues being relatively cool temperatures. 
But even uh, to kind of bring it back home to here uh, with us here in Virginia, we can actually look at the same kind of uh, uh, chart just as um, you know, colors for the state of Virginia. And so uh, looking at temperatures since 1895, again, cooler than average years are blue, warmer than average years are red. Nine out of our 10 warmest years on record have occurred since 1990. Um, and uh, several of them have occurred in just the last few years um, with 2019 being the second warmest year on record here, just behind 2012, which is the warmest year on record. Um, so uh, kind of bringing it back to where we're at now. So if we think about um, carbon emissions being one of the driving factors behind uh, planetary warming and uh, potentially even some of the, the impacts that we're seeing now, we can actually ask our climate models a really important question. You know, well, what exactly is the, the breakdown between human and natural in the present day. So here I'm showing you a graph up on this is a warmer than average planet. Down on this is a cooler than average planet. Uh, and from the left to the right is about 1870 to the present. And uh, so up on this is warmer and to the right is closer to the present. And so NASA, among other uh, groups like NOAA and several other Berkeley Earth have been taking uh, and recording measurements of the Earth's temperature through time. What we see is much like that graph that I showed you just before the blue and reds, uh, by far there's been a long-term trend towards warming. There's a star at where we're at roughly for the last couple of years. And so we can ask climate models that incorporate things like the planetary motion around the sun and uh, dim dimming and brightening of the sun on these 11 to couple hundred year time scales, as well as things like uh, volcanoes, which are very uh, uh, effective at cooling the planet because of ejecting aerosols like soot and ash into the, into the atmosphere. We can ask climate models like, if we were only talking about the natural part of the climate system, what does the Earth's temperature do over this same time period? And perhaps surprisingly, we see huge deviations below uh, times of substantial cooling. These happen to be the very substantial uh, um, eruptions of major volcanoes that I was just telling you about. And um, then, so if the sun, the orbital parameters and you know, volcanoes don't really have anything to do with it, then when we start to ask questions about, well, what about the human component? Supercomputer, tell me about you know, humans uh, deforesting the planet or uh, you know, creating low level ozone from emissions from uh, uh, factories and car tailpipes and um, other things that we do to change uh, the earth system like emitting heat trapping gases. Well, then we get a little bit better of an answer here in black is what the um, uh, mean, multi-model mean tells us should have happened over the last 150 or so years um, if it was only up to human factors. Now, what you might notice is that these don't actually match that well. Um, they match better than before, but they don't actually capture the full magnitude of the warming that we've seen over, over this time period. So when we incorporate all of it together, when we put both the human and the natural systems together, we get a really, really good answer. And I think that this is also another one of those discoveries that is really fundamentally amazing about our, our natural world is that we actually get a really good answer um, uh, from our understanding of the physical climate system that started almost 200 years ago. So, um, I wanna then bring it back to Virginia. So what, what about our contributions to the, the trends that we're seeing in these data over time? And so I'm showing you a pie chart. So a relatively bigger piece of the pie means that that's contributing more to our heat trapping gas emissions by sector in 2016, as of 2016. I haven't updated the data, but they're much the same as they were before. And so perhaps surprisingly, the largest impact uh, that we as a state have to uh, carbon emissions more generally is through our transportation. Things like our, 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 uh, how we get around in individual cars, plus our shipping, plus light duty trucks, and all those sorts of things that are uh, incorporated into our transportation system it's actually our number one emission source. Um, things like electric power, electrical power then fall in second place and then there's a diminishing uh, array from commercial, residential, things like our houses uh, and then industrial processes. You can delve into this information more if you'd like through the US Ener information, or Energy Information Agency or EIA to discover more about what these individual sources might be uh, related to. But speaking of transportation, 
something big has gone on in the past few days to completely and totally, well, not just past few days, past few weeks to completely change our transportation system almost overnight. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, starting on, uh, you know, March 13th was Executive Order 51, uh, which established the uh, cancellation of large uh, public events. And then in um, March 30th, uh, there was the stay at home order issued um, that basically uh, completely uh, changed the, you know, telework mandatory, those sorts of things. And what I want to share is that there's been... Um, uh, while we haven't been driving around, what we have seen is people doing other things instead. And so the Capitol Trail here that connects Richmond to Williamsburg, it's a beautiful asset to public infrastructure around here. I have seen usage skyrocket uh, amidst, amidst the pandemic, people trying to get outside and enjoy the natural world around them. Uh, the James River Park system uh, it, it here in Richmond has also seen a huge influx of people trying to socially distance responsibly. Uh, and so we are getting out and enjoying our public spaces, which is amazing. Public uh, health is greatly improved by access to things like parks and green space. Uh, and in fact, in a couple of weeks, we'll have a neuroscientist telling us about just that here on the Lunch Break Science um, uh, series. Um, Something else, uh, we, you know, down in Chesterfield, many of the parks that we have, uh, like Pocahontas State Park, has seen a huge uh, increase in, uh, in user uh, uh, access as well. Um, so just to, to understand that while we haven't, we haven't been using our cars, we have been using the great public spaces that the Commonwealth affords us um, and you know, getting out to enjoy the sun and the nice weather. Um, so uh, some of the other things that I've seen around the internet recently, um, it seems like leatherback sea turtles are thriving due to beach restrictions, um, which is maybe a, a, a something that you might enjoy um, thinking about, uh, uh, you know, potentially uh, improving the survivability of leatherback sea turtles. I know that whenever I watch like a nature documentary and see these poor sea turtles uh, go through that struggle, <laughs> uh, knowing that, that um, you know, by having more space uh, to make, to accommodate their uh, growth and, and, and success, that they last a long time. Maybe this is more funny to you. Um, a flock of sheep visited an empty McDonald's uh, in, in Wales, uh, of all places uh, in the UK. Uh, and stories like this are kind of everywhere right now. Um, and I just wanted to share some of the kind of more uh, uh, f funny or uh, inspiring ones to me. And so uh, to go back to the transportation thing, so our, our number one carbon emission source is transportation. So what's been going on nationwide? Well, what's amazing is that this group called INRIX, um, I put the link down there at the bottom, they've been writing blogs about how national traffic has been changing through time. I was turned on to this by Dan Salkovitz, who's a meteorologist at the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. So thank you, Dan, for helping me identify this data source. There's been a huge drop in passenger traffic uh, nationally. So this is about a 40% change uh, in passenger vehicle travel um, as compared to the last week of February. Um, and so it's something greater than about 45% nationally. Um, then if we look at traffic counters from just here in Richmond, this is at night, uh, Bryan Park on I-95, just about. It's not exactly right next to Bryan Park, but just down the road. And I've shown all the different types of cars at the top because there are car classifications that these traffic counters use to estimate the numbers of each type of car based on the distance between their axles and the number of axles that they have. And so locally, we've seen a huge reduction, similar magnitude, about 40% difference um, from the beginning of March to the last half of March and the beginning of April, with about 35% change in the amount of traffic uh, overall. There's still not as much of a change in our truck traffic, which is a good thing because we need those trucks to be moving the materials around for us to go still, you know, go shopping and maybe find some toilet paper. Um, if we're lucky, uh, but so uh, with, it's mostly passenger traffic. So that is saying that we are following social distancing guidelines. We are staying home and sheltering in place, staying safer and, and healthier at home. But uh, it's not just the, the traffic volume. It also means that we have a reduction in congestion. So this is the, v, the uh, VDOT Traffic Engineering and Operations Division. They have an online uh, Tableau platform where you can actually look at speeds and congestion versus last year at the same time. And so on the left here, we have a map of speeds uh, uh, in 2019, uh, March 2019. And then on the right, 
we have what's been going on since the 16th of March uh, to the present as far as uh, through 412 so a couple weeks ago. And so even though we've seen a reduction in congestion due to the falling volume, people have been speeding up. <laughs> uh, if you've done any driving um, for a necessary essential travel, you have probably noticed uh, that cars have gotten uh, maybe traveling a little bit faster. Um, and anecdotally around the city, I've heard people say that it seems like even cars on our residential roads are speeding up as well. Um, what this also means, uh, looking so far at the data uh, available to us through the TREADS program at Virginia Department of Transportation, we can look at the number of car crashes uh, <laughs> during the same time as well. So um, you might suspect that uh, with fewer cars on the road, um, there are fewer car crashes. And surprise, you're right. Um, it's a little bit less than, you know, about a 45% chance or 44, 45% change than average over the same months in uh, 2019 and 2018. So um, these are, of course, preliminary data uh, through yesterday. Uh, there's probably a lag between when car crash data actually make it into the state uh, uh, registry. But does this also mean then fewer vehicles, quieter cities um, that without all that traffic going on around us uh, and, and with fewer cars, uh, there has been a, 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 a substantial decrease in background noise in the city of Boston. Um, so in this article from April 2nd, we saw um, a group from Noise in the City register that they've seen a, an improvement of background noise in the city of Boston by about 30 decibels. That's a large range there. That's like going construction level, uh, you know, like construction zone down to quiet park uh, in the course of a few weeks. Now, I've heard some people around the city of Richmond say that it sounds like the birds are in stereo. Um, and I think that that's absolutely true. I've heard more birds, I feel like this spring than at any other time. And you might think that like they are actually singing louder, but without all the competition of the background noise, they might actually be singing quieter. And it's just the general um, uh, uh, quieting up of our city that you're actually experiencing. I'll talk about this more at the end of the talk, but um, many of you know uh, from the advertisements about this talk, we can talk a little bit about how our air quality is changing. Because as you know, many passenger vehicles, even though they have improved in their uh, miles per gallon, their uh, pollution standards throughout time since the Clean Air Act in 1970, at the first Earth Day um, 50 years ago, uh, 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 that we actually see um, a number of pollutants that come out of our tailpipes. The two that I'm going to talk about today are particulate matter and the nitrogen oxides, um, uh, basically. And so particulate matter is risky because it's smaller than the width of a few human hair. Um, so you can see the PM10 is something that's about 10 micrometers. It's about a seventh in the size of the width of a human hair. And then two points five is a fraction smaller than that. These are particles that can actually enter our, our, our lungs and, and exacerbate existing respiratory issues. This exposure has actually been linked to higher mortality rates of COVID-19. So uh, areas that are experiencing higher exposure to PM 2.5 tend to be those areas that also experience differential uh, uh, amounts or rates of asthma and those sorts of outcomes. So what's going on? You might have seen a couple of weeks ago, NASA put out this really amazing map of the of this uh, country of China, showing that f looking down from space through the air column, that their amount of NO2 or nitrogen dioxide, which is a, 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 a a secondary pollutant from what's coming out of tailpipes, a combination of nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide, NO2 and NO, or NOx, um, that after their lockdown, this, uh, this pollutant crashed um, out of their atmosphere, um, it's completely cleaning up their air column. It turns out that several uh, smart people around the Northeastern United States have been asking this about the United States as well. And so Tim Canty is someone at the University of Maryland who has been tracking this using the Tripomi satellite um, uh, here in the United States. And so far, and I know I just got an update uh, earlier today about this and wasn't able to include it in the presentation, but by and large, it does seem like compared to April 2018, 2019, that so far this month, there has been an improvement to air quality in the sense of NO2. However, there are some weather related things that are probably going on here. There's usually a seasonal improvement to our air quality as the sun angle changes due to this, the uh, uh, changing distribution of sunlight through the spring into the summer and several things related to just like wind as well as uh, precipitation potentially as well. So these are pre preliminary, excuse me, and our understanding is evolving every single day, which is actually really exciting. It shows how much we can learn in a rapid amount of time. But what about here in the Southeast? What about Richmond? 
Well, over the last, you know, uh, 20 or so years, actually the Southeast has been enjoying some of the cleanest air on record. Um, you know, the national standard is 100 parts per billion in NO2 as part of our air quality. We're well below that on average all the time. And in fact, here in, in Richmond last year, 2019 was the first time since observations started that we didn't have any unhealthy ozone air quality days. So we actually have some really amazing things to already be celebrating. We enjoy extremely clean air as it is compared to national standards here in Richmond and around the state of Virginia, which is a, a really important thing to realize as I go through these details in the next few slides. So looking at weekday average hourly NO2 at uh, Bryan Park uh, over the last several years, I just wanted to, do it, to investigate what's been going on locally. And so 2016, we have this kind of like two hump shape through the time of the day. So down on the bottom is the hour of the day from you know, uh, midnight to the, the following midnight. And you can see during, uh, uh, there's a two hump structure uh, probably related to the uh, transportation during rush hour traffic. And so 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019 look remarkably similar in that almost always there seems to be this early morning hump followed by an evening hump while we're all trying to get to and from. This is, of course, related to the you know, passenger traffic. Well, in 2020, we've seen this giant reduction, 40% reduction in passenger travel. So have we seen a, a corresponding reduction in the amount of NO2? And uh, it turns out it looks like we have. Um, and while, again, there's probably some sort of meteorological impact on this as well, Follow-up studies will be able to tell us a little bit more about these trends and whether uh, we can truly, how much of it we can attribute to the traffic volume. Um, so that's, uh, as far as NO2, it looks like there's been an observable decrease, especially during the times of day when we would be expecting to see the reduction due to a passenger travel um, reduction. Now, what about particulate matter? So again, this is the um, small little particles that can get inside of our lungs. And so 2016, again, you can see the same kind of shape. Uh, through the day, 2017, 2018, and then last year, 2019, it was kind of bucking the, what looked like a little bit of a trend through those years. And even 2020 seems to be on an hourly average of PM 2.5. We've um, generally seen a, a, a corresponding decrease during our time periods where cars are normally operating alongside Bryan Park. So um, what's interesting about 2020 and 2019 is that they both have relatively high amounts of precipitation. So particulate matter is scrubbed out of the air by precipitation. Uh, and so these two years being relatively rainy um, uh, might have contributed to a little bit of this signal as well. Again, what we're gonna be able to do now uh, and, and following um, uh, the, uh, the next few months is to continue to trace these uh, and uh, learn more about what the traffic has been responsible for and what we can attribute to, um, to changes in uh, our air quality. Now, again, I want to, I want to stress that it's hard to say, um, you know, that there's like a sil silver lining because, you know, our, these reductions are somewhat of a result of necessary lockdowns for public health uh, and maintaining the spread of the virus. Um, it's been really, uh, you know, tempor temporary and inconvenient for our everyday life. Um, and it's been economically devastating as we've seen. So um, also uh, it, it, it draws on that idea that we're not separate from nature, you know, humans and nature are, it's our habitat. And so the activities that we participate in can have these huge impacts on the earth um, in a relatively rapid amount of time. But these things are temporary reductions. They're probably in many ways might even rebound uh, to higher amounts after um, restrictions are lifted. And so what are some more like permanent carbon emissions reductions? So transportation that only seems to be like a temporary thing. What are some of the things that we can be doing? Well, renewable, um, renewable energy is one of those things. Energy efficiency is a great way to reduce the amount of emissions from residential areas. Um, offshore wind is one of the opportunities that we have locally here to expand uh, renewable energy that we might not be able to do onshore land as much as some other parts of the country. Um, you know, solar and distributed generation. What's great is that the, uh, as far as, um, you know, today, the, the state legislature is at the Science Museum of Virginia. And, uh, you know, the Virginia Clean Economy Act does all of these things for the state of Virginia, you know, and, and moves us towards this kind of long term uh, shift towards uh, reducing the amount of carbon emissions through time. So uh, that's a very good step. It's some of the most comprehensive energy um, uh, uh, 
and carbon emission uh, reform in the whole Southeast and definitely a leadership role across the country. Um, but then, you know, thinking about how our traffic relates to this is that we can still continue to improve electrical vehicle infrastructure and expand the amount of public and active uh, transportation options that we have. Because if we like the idea that our air can be so much cleaner than this, then what are some of those more permanent changes that we can make to our streets, to our neighborhoods that allow people to make uh, the changes to, to, uh, to um, you know, r get rid of the uh, em emissions that are coming out of their tailpipes. Um, so those are all sorts of things that um, can be more permanent um, uh, transformations that um, uh, can exist. And then the last little bit of the presentation, I know um, uh, we're getting near the end of the hour. I just wanted to quickly run through some of the other things that we've been up to uh, and, and reflect on some of the other climate impacts that are common to here in Virginia. Chapter 18 and chapter 19 of the National Climate Assessment are uh, generally boiled downable to uh, we need to be preparing for a hotter, wetter, sneezier, and wheezier Virginia. What do I mean by sneezier and, uh, and warmer? Well, uh, a colleague of mine at ODU, Michael Allen, has been tracking the onset dates of our various um, seasons through time. And these are four maps of the United States. Um, our springs, or, or, our autumns and winters have been arriving later. Um, so it, it, to get to the temperatures that we would normally associate with uh, autumn and winter, those have been moving uh, later into the year, whereas spring and summertime temperatures have been moving earlier in the year. So um, uh, our, our, throughout Richmond, we've seen um, this kind of loss of our frost season. And in fact, uh, uh, We'll get back to this in a second, but this year was especially interesting. But so what we've seen is earlier springs and summers as exchange of later um, uh, autumns and, and winters. Now, uh, what's been going on this year? Well, over time here, we're looking at the date of the last freeze. So what we might consider to be like the onset of spring. Down here, it's the, since the start of observations at the airport from 1930 to, to, to this year. Now you can uh, say uh, caveats about the airport record uh, here locally, but these trends are seen um, all across the, the, the Commonwealth. But it looks like through time, there has been a decrease or a, an earlier arrival to the last freeze date here in Virginia, um, or here in Richmond especially. And uh, 2020, uh, as far as I know, uh, we didn't break the um, existing March 8th as the, the last time that freezing temperatures were reached at the airport. And that's a new record in the entire um, uh, last, uh, you know, in this, in the time period that we've been observing it at the airport. So March 8th, the earliest last freeze on record. And what does that mean for our public health? Well, Becky Colley at the Allergy Partners Richmond have been, has been climbing up onto the rooftop of the uh, Allergy Partners Richmond or the Henrico Doctors Hospital since 1988. And she's been measuring the amount of tree pollen in the air. Along the bottom here, we have the spring of 2017 from June to May. And up on the graph here, we have tree pollen count in the air. Uh, this is what a typical tree pollen season looks like with a, tree, a peak tree pollen date. That's the day that every, everyone's car is colored in yellow dust. Uh, and then a tree pollen count, over 4,000 grains in the air uh, uh, per cubic meter of air. That's really, really sneezy conditions, even for people that aren't allergic to uh, poll tree pollen. And so we can look at what happened this year. So far, um, we had kind of a couple surges of tree pollen um, uh, throughout the early season. And over the last few weeks, it's been pretty substantially high uh, throughout the last several weeks. So if you've been wheezing and sneezing and, uh, and watery eyes, um, it, that's probably like a lot of people. And tw we had a 2,925 2 count on the 14th. And that seems to be right now evidence for the peak tree pollen date of 2020. So what has that been doing through time? We can actually look back over the last 35 years and see that not only has our last frost arrived earlier, but also this tr peak tree pollen date has moved backwards in time by about a week and a half. Now also that amount of peak tree pollen, the amount that's actually uh, emerging in the spring has correspondingly gone up. So not only are the springs earlier, the tree pollen season is happening earlier and it peaks, it's even stronger. So this has a direct impact on the amount of uh, allergy medication that we might be choosing to take uh, during our, our, our spring season. And um, so uh, quickly, I want to go through um, the, the fact that many people that live in the Commonwealth of Virginia are along our eastern shore and uh, in coastal communities. The amount of sea level rise has been going up uh, for a variety of reasons. So the, the coastline is sinking due to land subsidence due to extraction of groundwater, as well as relaxing from the end of the last ice age. Uh, as the ocean is warming up because of the planet warming up as, as water 
heats up and expands. And so uh, along the coast, Norfolk, Virginia has one of the highest rates of sea level all along the entire United States East Coast, presenting a very um, unique challenge um, to, that, to those communities that live among uh, rising water and having to deal with nuisance floods that keep them away from places of worship and their jobs um, on an increasingly common basis. Um, but also throughout the Southeast and here in Virginia, we've seen an increase in the amount of precipitation. As air warms up, it's able to hold more water vapor and allowing for more devastating precipitation events to occur. Here in Virginia, we've seen a significant change in the number of days with more than an uh, inch of rain falling all at once here in Richmond. That's one of the locations um, that that's occurring. And why is that a problem for us here in Virginia? Well, uh, in, you know, the projected change into the future is that as the climate continues to change, that might have a, an increase again with more extreme precipitation. Why does that matter to us here in Virginia? Well, we have one of the oldest um, uh, uh, stormwater systems uh, in America. <laughs> and what if we have a really extreme precipitation event, sometimes that can overwhelm the ability for the storage uh, or the combined sewer and stormwater system to accommodate all of that water flowing into it at once. That can then cause what is known as a combined sewer overflow event that can discharge um, uh, uh, stormwater and sewage directly into the James River. Now, um, that has been improved drastically over the last 30 or so years. And so now um, I implore you to go check out the um, RVA H2O program and learn about what Richmond is doing to address its combined sewer overflows and reduce the total amount of volume that's going into the river each year. Um, but through a combination of both gray and green infrastructure projects. Of course, this is the, uh, the um, um, park down uh, along the, um, uh, our, our low line uh, occurring. It's a beautiful place. Uh, start of the Capitol Trail is nearby. So um, I wanna quickly tell you a little about heat and then, and then we'll, um, we'll wrap up here. Uh, extreme heat is a uh, number one weather related uh, fatality in the country and here in Richmond as temperature goes up to the right so down here we're not looking at time we're actually looking at temperature from cooler to much hotter 120 degrees Fahrenheit and then up on this is the percentage of people that are going to the hospital for heat related illnesses perhaps unsurprisingly as it gets warmer more people get sick and in 2019, more than 1,000 Virginians went to the emergency care centers and emergency departments for heat-related illnesses. Now, why is this important? Well, heat doesn't uh, uh, do the same thing everywhere at the same time. And of course, in our urban areas, things that we've designed our human environment around, things like brick, asphalt, and uh, cement, are much warmer here. The, the warmer colors are bright orange and the cooler colors are purple. The natural landscapes are much cooler than these human landscapes. And the colors of our cars can tell us a lot about how much the temperature of the roof is going to be. Uh, and both the plant choices that we make has a huge impact as well. We have a natural native plant garden here in, at the Science Museum of Virginia, which is much cooler than the non-native European grasses that we tend to have uh, very substantially around our, uh, uh, our um, like schools and, and uh, large parks. And so um, looking at this more deeply, we worked with the RVA Green Program, which I'll come back to at the end. The, the mayor is in something right as we speak um, to go check out the RVA Green 2050 plan, Alicia and Brianne. And then Groundwork RVA, which is a nonprofit that works to green Richmond. Um, and we know that one of the best ways to cool down a place is by in investing in native um, uh, trees and, and plants. Um, so their uh, mission is to uh, improve youth or prepare youth for success, improve the health and quality of life and realize racial equity. So the uh, impacts on climate change through their work are, are enormous for our community. We went out and measured the air temperature using these little tiny sensors that could cling to the sides of our cars. And what was amazing is that we identified a 16 degree Fahrenheit difference between the warmest and coolest place at the same time on the same day in the middle of July, 2017. We looked at then, well, where do people get picked up by the ambulance the most for heat related illnesses? Perhaps unsurprisingly, the map of where the Richmond Ambulance Authority responds to heat-related illnesses the most over the last five years looks almost identical to the same places that have higher than the average temperatures during a heat wave. Um, this work has now found its way into the Richmond 300 plan and as well as the uh, um, a sustainability plan for the city RV Green 2050. And so um, the Science Museum is taking this to heart and we're going to build um, a, a civic green space along Broad Street. We're going to pair up that uh, giant parking lot in front of the Children's Museum and in front of the Science Museum 
uh, after we finish a parking garage uh, on our property and turn that entire frontage into a civic green space that'll make use of the best practices for stormwater and heat management as well as air quality improvement. Um, and I, we're so excited to share this with the city of Virginia and the state of, or the city of Richmond and the state of Virginia um, that I, I, I won't say too much more about that. But if you want to help us out with understanding more about air quality, we are going to be launching a new uh, Institute of Museum and Library Services funded project uh, for uh, monitoring air quality, both in stationary sensors that we set up at your house or your business. And we're going to be putting together groups of people when we're all able to get together again in public uh, to walk around the city of Richmond in various neighborhoods to analyze the air quality um, throughout different time periods uh, during the day. And so if you want to learn more about that project, go to uh, bit.ly slash rvair. And I would say if you have some free time right now, which many of us do, uh, that if you want to sign up for this program called Noise Score, go to Noise Score app, uh, both in the App Store on Apple or iTunes, and the Google Play Store and start recording sound around Richmond and around the state of Virginia. This is the most critical time for us to be uh, amassing as much data as we can about our natural environment without the um, uh, you know, influence of a lot of our natural way of getting around. So we can get a lot of baseline information out of the way right now and you can contribute to it by signing up for the Noise Score app. And you can search for it both in iTunes and on Google Play. More about how you can help. If you live in Richmond or around the Richmond region, um, you can go to richmond300.com and click participate or sign up to be a Richmond RVA Green 2050 plan ambassador at rvagreen2050.com slash ambassador program. Um, at this point, I figure that we have uh, just a few minutes for uh, addressing some questions. Please hang out if you can. Thank you so much for your attention and happy Earth Day, everybody. Jeremy, thank you. Um, I've got some questions for you. Uh, sure. One of the one of the ones at the very end said that uh, could you go back to the slide real quick that had some of the links, uh, the the shortened uh, URLs. Yeah. So uh, bit.ly slash RV air and join dash RV air. If you sign up at the bit.ly slash join dash RV air, I think it's case sensitive. So uh, sign up and we'll get in contact with you as we start to be able to, as soon as social distancing can be relaxed and accommodate uh, community science, uh, we will do so. And Back from, back from very early on in the talk, we had a question when you were talking about fishing, uh, about does the increase in temperature have an impact on the level of oxygen in lakes and rivers? And if so, what impact does that have for all the species? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as water warms up, it's unable to hold as much oxygen. So actually, as you warm up a body of water up, it loses its ability to hold on to and absorb oxygen. So um, this is partially what goes on every year uh, in the Chesapeake Bay and the creation of large dead zones is partially because of the warming up of that body of water, um, as well as blooms, toxic algal blooms and those sorts of things. So yes, as temperatures warm up, um, uh, bodies of water can lose the ability to hold on to oxygen, lowering the availability of that. And that has a devastating impact on things that require relatively high levels of oxygen, like specific types of fish. Another question uh, was, and I think you addressed some of this in the talk after the question was posted, but uh, elaborate a little on, uh, you mentioned effects of the quarantine on air quality and noise pollution. Any guesses on how long it would take to see uh, impactful effects on the temperature? And mm. I know you talked a little bit about it, but I think they wanted to know a little bit more. Yeah, so you can think about our, our uh, the really important thing about carbon emissions and long-term warming of the planet is not so much one year's worth of emissions. You can think of it like a pile of bricks. Uh, our cumulative amount of carbon emissions has made this giant pile of bricks. And that's all of the amount of CO2 that we put into the atmosphere. One year, one year is one brick. By breaking that brick in half and putting it on the pile, it's not going to change the total cumulative amount of uh, carbon in the atmosphere to the, uh, to the extent that we'll see a very substantial impact on long-term climate warming from one year's worth of carbon emissions. So um, 
Many estimates suggest that we need to be uh, consistently uh, lowering our carbon emissions by about five to 7% every single year uh, in order to see a downturn in global temperatures. We're gonna see about a temporary reduction of about 5% globally for just a few months. So again, these changes are not permanent. These are just uh, temporary changes that won't have necessarily the same kind of impact. I will say, however, that if we reduce the amount of aerosols through things like NO2, um, and uh, sulfate uh, uh, aerosols from burning coal and those sorts of things uh, d during the year, we might see a small increase in temperature because we're not releasing reflective aerosols into the air at the same time. So we won't necessarily see a cooling from a reduction in carbon, but we might see a nearly undetectable warming from a loss of aerosols that we're putting into the air. So it's kind of a, a, an interesting um, uh, uh, dual-edged kind of thing that's going on. Great question. All right, um, I think we have, uh, we'll have time for one more. Um, there's a few more in the talk, but I'll save them and I'll, uh, I'll forward them to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we can, I'll, I'll, do a, I'll do a blog response. That sounds yeah. like a lot of fun. Um, also, uh, for, for what it's worth, those join RVA error aren't working. So folks, um, I put your email in the chat, Jeremy, so we okay, can fix great. that link for them. Yes, I will do. Sorry about that, everyone. Yeah, no worries. Um, so the last question um, that I think we have time for, it says, um, in your opinion, is there a carbon dioxide tipping point from which we reach a point of no return? 450 parts per million, for instance. Um, many people believe that 1.5 degrees Celsius is already baked in, even though Virginia is moving to renewables. Mm. Well, so uh, there's, uh, even though many people might uh, uh, think like or, or, or understand it like that. We do know from the best estimates of carbon trajectories that we still have uh, uh, time. We have to have our emissions of carbon by, uh, uh, by 2030 uh, and, and definitely so we, we have like 12, you've heard about this, we have 12 years. That's to reduce our carbon emissions by about half um, uh, it, it, the next 12, well, that was in 2018. So by 2030, we need to have our emissions from 2010 levels to put us on the pathway to, 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 uh, to not get global warming above about a degree and a half. And so we still have time. And so any of these big, uh, uh, you know, moonshot kinds of things and, and really transitioning Virginia to a clean, a renewable energy portfolio are definitely needed. And so we can't, uh, in many ways, say uh, it's too late. I think that anything that we do is going to improve the long-term outcomes. Uh, tipping points, constantly being researched. There's, new, uh, there's a new review out of points. Um, carbon tipping points uh, are interesting because uh, we, you know, I think there have been times in Earth's past where we've seen a rapid re re release of carbon and certainly uh, the earth takes care of that carbon over many hundreds of millions of years afterwards, uh, such as the uh, Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum 65 million years ago, or 60, uh, um, 60 or so million years ago. Um, so I don't, uh, there are other tipping points that I think are more um, uh, better understood and those are related to sea level and ice sheets. Um, what uh, those tipping points might do is to have sea level rise a lot faster than we might be currently anticipating. And that's part of my PhD work on what is known as the last interglacial. So if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, please reach out to me and I'll, I'll, I'll send you along some, some interesting reading um, and you can come to uh, your own understanding. All right, well, uh, thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, and thank you everybody who joined us today. Um, next week at noon on Wednesday, April 29th. We will have our astronomer Justin Bartle talking about seeing space without leaving your place. Um, you can register for that at um, Science Museum of Virginia, our website. We'll also be putting it up on our social media with the evite link. And um, thank you guys for joining us and happy Earth Day. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks, everybody.